let's get started. Number 9. Natural Means Safe Imagine standing in a store, holding two bottles. One says synthetic, the other says 100% natural. Your brain doesn't hesitate. One feels like a chemistry experiment. The other feels like a hug from a forest. You pick the forest hug. And that's exactly where the lie begins. Natural is not a safety rating. It's a marketing adjective. Arsenic is natural. Hemlock is natural. Cyanide comes from fruit pits. Nature is not a gentle yoga instructor. It's an unpaid scientist running chaos experiments for billions of years. Here's the psychological trick. Humans evolved to trust familiar-looking things. Leaves, roots, berries. These look like food, not danger. So, when a supplement label slaps a green leaf on the bottle and whispers, plant-based, your brain relaxes. Critical thinking clocks out early. But vitamins don't care where they came from. Vitamin C from a lab and vitamin C squeezed out of an orange molecule for molecule do the same thing in your body. Your cells don't clap because it was ethically sourced. Worse, natural supplements are often less predictable. Plants vary by soil, climate, harvest timing, and processing. One capsule might contain what the label promises. The next might contain twice that amount, or something else entirely. Synthetic vitamins, ironically, are boringly consistent. Same dose, same structure, same effect. History is full of people poisoning themselves politely because it's herbal. Ancient Rome loved plant-based remedies. Many of them died confidently. And here's the darkly funny part. When people get side effects from natural products, they don't blame the supplement. They blame themselves. Maybe I detox too hard. Maybe my body is adjusting. That's not wellness. That's Stockholm Syndrome with a label. Nature didn't design supplements to be safe. Humans designed supplements to feel safe by borrowing nature's aesthetic. The forest doesn't care about your liver. Number 8. More vitamins, shop or more health. There's a strange belief that vitamins work like good intentions. If some is helpful, more must be heroic. Two pills, fine, six, commitment, twelve, you're basically immortal now. Your body disagrees. Vitamins are not magic points in a video game. They're tools, very specific tools, and your body only needs them in narrow ranges. Go below that range, things break. Go above it, things break louder. Fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, are especially sneaky. Your body stores them instead of flushing them out. That sounds efficient until you realize it's like hoarding batteries inside your organs. Too much vitamin A can damage your liver and bones. Too much vitamin D can raise calcium levels until your kidneys quietly file a complaint. And yet, supplement culture treats dosage like a challenge. High potency. Megadose. Clinical strength. None of these phrases mean appropriate. They mean someone assumed your body enjoys being overwhelmed. Here's the misunderstood science. Deficiency diseases were common in the past because food was scarce and monotonous. Vitamins saved lives. That success story never got updated. Now people with normal diets are swallowing backup systems for problems they don't have. Psychologically, this taps into control. Vitamins feel proactive. You're not waiting to get sick. You're doing something. Even if that something is unnecessary or counterproductive, it feels responsible. The irony? Your body has safety mechanisms, absorption limits, transport proteins, feedback loops. Megadosing is basically yelling at those systems until they give up and let chaos in. More vitamins don't make you healthier. They make your urine more expensive and your organs more stressed. Health isn't built by flooding the system. It's built by balance, timing, and restraint. Three things supplement marketing avoids mentioning. Number seven. Herbal cancels risk. There's a comforting fantasy hiding behind a lot of supplement labels. If something is herbal, it must gently balance out anything bad. Took a heavy dose? Don't worry, it's plant-based. Mix three supplements together? It's fine. They'll harmonize. Like a wellness jazz band. That belief is scientifically wrong and quietly dangerous. Herbal products don't cancel risk. They add variables. Plants contain dozens, sometimes hundreds of bioactive compounds. Some we understand, many we don't. When you concentrate those compounds into pills, teas, extracts, or super blends, you're no longer dealing with folk remedies. You're dealing with pharmacology without supervision. Here's the uncomfortable science. Many herbs act on the same liver enzymes that process prescription drugs. St. John's wort is the classic example. It's natural, popular, and capable of reducing the effectiveness of antidepressants, birth control pills, heart medications, and more by speeding up drug metabolism. No warning bells, no dramatic symptoms, just quiet interference. Grapefruit, yes. The breakfast fruit can increase drug potency by blocking enzyme pathways. That's not detox. That's biochemical sabotage in a smoothie. 
The myth survives because herbal side effects are subtle. When something goes wrong, it doesn't feel like poisoning. It feels like off, fatigue, brain fog, mood swings, sleep issues. People rarely connect those symptoms to the herbal stack they started two weeks ago because the narrative says plants are supportive, not disruptive. Historically, herbal medicine worked under strict traditions, trained practitioners, limited combinations, careful observation. Modern supplement culture threw out the restraint and kept the aesthetic. Now, people mix immunity boosters, stress reducers, sleep enhancers, and metabolism optimizers like they're assembling a playlist. Your liver is not impressed. Science doesn't care if a compound came from a leaf or a lab. If it alters enzymes, receptors, or hormones, it has consequences. Herbal doesn't mean gentle. It means biologically active, whether the label admits it or not. Plants are powerful. That's why they work. And that's exactly why pretending they're harmless is the most dangerous belief of all. Number six, food-based is better. Picture this. A supplement bottle proudly announces made from real foods. Somewhere in your brain, a tiny chef appears, chopping carrots and smiling approvingly. Surely this must be superior to those cold, clinical lab-made vitamins. Science sighs and pulls up a chair. Food-based sounds meaningful, but nutritionally, it's often meaningless. Once vitamins are extracted, isolated, stabilized, and packed into capsules, they are no longer food. They are nutrients separated from the fiber, enzymes, and complex matrices that made the original food. Well, food. Here's the misunderstood part. The benefits of whole foods come from systems, not ingredients. An orange isn't powerful because of vitamin C alone. It's powerful because of fiber, flavonoids, water content, and slow digestion working together. Strip out one component, dry it, concentrate it, and put it in a capsule, and you've lost the context that made it special. Many food-based supplements are made by adding synthetic vitamins to yeast or plant material, then drying the mixture and calling it natural. Chemically, the vitamin inside is the same. Psychologically, the label feels safer. Another issue, bioavailability. Some food-derived nutrients are actually harder to absorb in supplement form. Iron bound in certain plant matrices, for example, can be less efficiently absorbed than carefully formulated synthetic versions designed to survive stomach acid and reach the bloodstream. And then there's dosage ambiguity. Equivalent to 10 servings of vegetables is not a scientific measurement. It's a poetic one. Your intestines don't convert marketing metaphors into absorption rates. The belief persists because it feels logical. Real food is good, so food-based pills must be better. But science isn't built on vibes, it's built on mechanisms. Whole foods are superior when eaten as foods. Once they're powdered and sold in capsules, they follow the same biochemical rules as everything else. Nature doesn't give bonus points for nostalgia. Number five, you can't overdose on vitamins. There's a quiet confidence people have when swallowing vitamins. Pills are small, labels are friendly. Nothing about them screams medical risk. So the assumption sneaks in, if it's sold without a prescription, it must be impossible to overdo. That assumption has sent plenty of people to the hospital. Scientifically, overdose doesn't mean instant collapse. It means toxicity from accumulation or excessive exposure. And vitamins absolutely qualify. The difference is timing. Drug overdoses are dramatic. Vitamin toxicity is patient. It waits. Fat-soluble vitamins are the usual suspects. Vitamin A toxicity has been documented for decades, causing headaches, nausea, liver damage, bone thinning, and in severe cases, increased intracranial pressure. Vitamin D toxicity raises blood calcium levels, which can calcify soft tissues and quietly damage kidneys. No fireworks, just long-term consequences. Even water-soluble vitamins aren't innocent. High doses of vitamin B6 over time can cause nerve damage, leading to numbness and tingling. Vitamin C, in excess, increases the risk of kidney stones in susceptible individuals. Niacin can cause liver injury when taken in large supplemental doses. The reason this myth survives is psychological framing. Vitamins are categorized as support, not intervention. People don't track them like medications. They stack multivitamins, immunity boosters, energy formulas, and stress blends, each staying under its own safe limit, while the total quietly climbs past it. Medical literature is very clear on this. Toxicity is dose-dependent and duration-dependent. No nutrient is exempt. Your body needs vitamins the way a car needs oil. Enough keeps things running smoothly. Too much doesn't make the engine better. It floods it. Lack of fear doesn't equal lack of risk. It just delays awareness. Number four, if it worked, you'd feel it. There's a popular rule of thumb in supplement culture. If you don't feel something, it must not be doing anything. No buzz, no warmth, no sudden clarity then it's useless. 
And if you do feel something, energy, calm, lightness, then it must be working. Science would like to object. Most vitamins don't announce themselves. They participate quietly in metabolism, enzyme function, DNA synthesis, and cellular repair. When they're doing their job properly, you feel normal. No fireworks, no transformation montage. Deficiency symptoms are loud because systems are breaking down. Adequate levels are silent because systems are stable. Expecting a sensation from a vitamin is like expecting applause from your pancreas. This belief leads to two problems. First, people abandon necessary supplements because they don't feel anything. Second, they chase products that do create noticeable sensations, often stimulants, vasodilators, or compounds that alter neurotransmitters. Those feelings can be real, but they're not proof of nutritional correction. There's also the placebo effect, which is powerful, measurable, and not imaginary. If you expect energy, you may perceive energy. That doesn't mean the supplement addressed a deficiency. It means your brain participated enthusiastically. The more dangerous flip side is invisible harm. Liver strain, kidney stress, and nerve damage don't feel dramatic at first. They develop quietly while the user keeps thinking, if something was wrong, I'd notice. Biology doesn't send notifications. It sends bills later. The most effective nutrients often feel boring. They stabilize rather than stimulate. They prevent problems rather than perform. If a supplement makes you feel something immediately, that doesn't mean it's helping. And if it makes you feel nothing, that doesn't mean it's useless. Health is quiet when it's working. Number three, natural boosts immunity. Every cold season, labels get louder. Immune defense, shield, armor, boost. The language makes your immune system sound like a sleepy employee who just needs a strong coffee and a motivational speech. That's not how immunity works. Scientifically, the immune system doesn't want to be boosted. It wants to be regulated. Overactivity is just as dangerous as underactivity. Allergies, autoimmune diseases, and chronic inflammation are all examples of an immune system doing too much, not too little. Here's the key misunderstanding. Many immune-boosting supplements stimulate certain immune pathways without context. They don't ask whether your immune system needs stimulation or where. They just push buttons. Vitamin C is a classic example. Adequate intake supports normal immune function. Megadosing doesn't create a superimmune state. Large studies show it may slightly reduce cold duration in some populations, but it does not prevent illness in the general public. The narrative grew far larger than the evidence. Herbal products complicate this further. Echinacea, elderberry, and similar herbs can activate immune signaling. In some cases, that's helpful. In others, it can worsen autoimmune symptoms or inflammatory responses. That's not speculation. That's immunology. The word boost survives because it feels empowering. It suggests control. But immunity is not a volume knob. It's a network of checks, balances, and trade-offs. Ironically, chronic immune stimulation can exhaust the system. Constant signaling keeps inflammatory pathways active, which can increase fatigue and susceptibility to illness over time. A calm, well-fed, well-rested immune system works better than an excited one. Nature doesn't hand out immunity upgrades. It enforces balance. And balance doesn't sell as well as promises. Number two, supplements fix bad diets. There's a quiet deal many people make with themselves. Eat poorly now, fix it later, with pills, missed vegetables, capsule, too much sugar, antioxidant, late night, a greasy food, no sleep, multivitamin to the rescue. Nutrition science says that deal was never signed. Supplements are called supplements for a reason. They're designed to fill gaps, not replace foundations. No vitamin can recreate the mechanical, hormonal, and microbial effects of real food. Chewing matters, fiber matters, slow digestion matters. The gut microbiome doesn't thrive on isolated nutrients. It thrives on complex inputs. Take fiber as an example. It regulates blood sugar, feeds gut bacteria, and reduces cardiovascular risk. No vitamin pill replaces that. You can swallow every nutrient on the label and still miss the structure that food provides. There's also nutrient interaction. Iron absorption depends on vitamin C. Calcium competes with magnesium. Fat-soluble vitamins need dietary fat. Food naturally solves these equations. Supplements guess. Psychologically, supplements create a moral loophole. People feel healthier because they're doing something, which can reduce motivation to fix the actual problem. Studies consistently show that people who rely heavily on supplements are not necessarily healthier than those who don't, unless there's a genuine deficiency. The uncomfortable truth, if supplements could fix bad diets, chronic disease rates would be plummeting. Instead, they rise alongside supplement sales. Pills are efficient, bodies are not. You can't out-supplement poor nutrition. You can only decorate it. Number one, if it's legal, it's proven. This is the most dangerous lie because it feels official. 
People assume that if a supplement is sold openly, regulated, and neatly packaged, it must be proven safe and effective. In reality, dietary supplements occupy a strange legal gray zone in many countries, including the U.S., and supplements are regulated as foods, not drugs. That means manufacturers are responsible for safety, but they do not need to prove effectiveness before selling. Products can reach shelves without large clinical trials. Oversight often happens after problems appear, not before. Labels can't claim to treat diseases, but they can suggest support, balance, or optimization. These words are legally vague and scientifically slippery. They sound meaningful while promising nothing measurable. Independent testing frequently finds discrepancies, incorrect dosages, undeclared ingredients, contamination with heavy metals or pharmaceuticals. Not always, but often enough to matter. The science lesson here is simple. Legality does not equal validation. It means the product met labeling rules, not that it transformed health outcomes. Evidence comes from controlled trials, reproducibility, and mechanism, not from availability. When something truly works, medicine adopts it. When it doesn't, marketing keeps it alive. Trust data, not shelf space. That's it for today. I'll be doing similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.